Good morning. Thank you. Um, I want to start off with a little bit of history. Um, some of you may have seen in the program my organization name has changed a little bit. Um, but I want to give you a little history of who we are. Um, since the 1980s, the Washington Humane Society has had the contract with the uh, city of the District of Columbia to provide animal control services. We are also a nonprofit, we also have a nonprofit uh, humane society arm of that, which does all of the animal cruelty investigations and all of the, um, and, and sheltering. In 2007, uh, WHS went on a national search for a new uh, chief executive officer and president and they found Lisa LaFontaine who was running a shelter doing amazing work in uh, New Hampshire and she had done some pretty incredible things um, to turn a shelter in New Hampshire around and make it a model for the region and uh, they hired her. In 2016, uh, this year, this past February, there were, there were historically two Humane Societies in Washington, D.C. The Washington Animal Rescue League, uh, which was a limited uh, admission shelter that focused a lot on low-cost medical care and import, uh, importation of dogs from the South and handling animals that were uh, part of national disasters and, and so forth, and the Washington Humane Society. We merged uh, in February to become one organization. Uh, now we are the one-stop shopping for the entire city. Any animal-related issue, anything at all, now you only have to call one number and you get, um, you get us. And we rebranded, we did a complete rebranding. If you notice, we were the Washington Humane Society. We merged with the Washington Animal Rescue League, so we took the middle name of each agency, Washington uh, Humane Rescue and Alliance, and um, you know, we built an alliance from it. So that's where we are today. Um, in 2007, when Lisa was named uh, CEO, she asked me, I had been working at the Massachusetts SPCA for uh, most of my life, it feels like, and she had asked me to come down and join her. She said that she had just been named uh, president and that she was going down in a couple of months and that this was an organization that needed some help, um, to put it lightly. So um, I said, you, you know, talk to me when you get down there. We'll, we'll see what's going on. She went down there, and a couple months later, she called me. And, and just so you know, I, I want to just point this out. I had it made at the MSPCA. I had been there for over 17 years. I had held various positions. Um, I was a state police officer investigating animal cruelty with them. Uh, at that point uh, in my career, I was actually uh, a lobbyist with them, working at the, the state house, getting positive bills passed and successfully fighting, you know, uh, anti-animal legislation, had a nice office overlooking the Boston skyline, um, direct, you know, direct to the president of the organization. I had, these people were my family. I had no reason at all to leave. So Lisa brought me down and I, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. And this is what we, this is what I walked into. Um, an organization that had a 30%, and that's being generous, um, we didn't keep all that greater records back then. Um, they had a 30% live release rate. It was next to impossible to adopt an animal from the, wa from the Washington Humane Society. You had to go through a really rigorous uh, application process and then wait a few days for someone to come out to your house and uh, do a home check. And then if you were approved, then you would have to come back to the shelter, get the animal. During all this time, we're a um, high volume shelter. We are 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, we take in animals. Uh, we were taking in about 12 to 13,000 animals a year. And with that type of adoption process, no wonder most of them were dying. Um, pit bulls were automatically deemed dangerous. And that was not a city ordinance. That was not a law. That was not a regulation. That was an internal policy within the Washington Humane Society that pit bulls were dangerous animals and were euthanized immediately. Um, we had a TNR program that was a pilot program, which um, I'm doing a TNR uh, workshop later on. I'll get more into it then. But it was basically just uh, it was you had to you had to jump through hoops to get your cat certified to be a TNR uh, candidate. Um, we did very limited, if any, offsite adoptions. Very limited foster program. No no real transfer to other other program you know, other organizations, uh, and we. If you didn't want your animal anymore, all you had to do was call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and say, I'm done, I don't want this animal anymore. And an officer would come pick the animal up for free, 
no questions asked, and bring the animal to the shelter. And our facility was basically um, built in the 60s as a holding facility so that it, there were no, no, no adoptions were supposed to be done out of this building. It was just your typical city pound that um, held animals for five or seven days or whatever and then would euthanize the animals. Very limited cat space uh, at all. So it was a mess. In fact, um, I, when I went down and met with, the, met with Lisa, she brought me to the shelter and I walked in like, oh my God, what the heck is this? And I sat down with the shelter manager to just talk to her a little bit. And she actually, at that point, broke down crying, um, that she couldn't take it anymore. She was burning out. The, the, the good staff that were there were burning out. A lot of people there were just there because it was a, a decent job with great benefits. Um, it, 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 was, it, was really, uh, it was really difficult. It was, it was an ugly situation. So I gave up uh, everything I had worked for for 17 years, and um, I, I joined this to turn it around. So the first, my first day on the job, literally my first day on the job, Lisa picked me up and we went to a senior staff meeting. We sat down and Lisa said, effective immediately, the pit bull policy is no longer uh, the policy. We will now treat pit bulls like we do any other dog. And I'll get to that in a second. Um, we, you know, we, 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 had a real, we realized that we had to change a lot of laws that were on the book. Um, our internal procedures and policies were not life-saving. They were not life-saving at all. Our reputation in the community was the shelter was a place for animals to go to die. And if you saw one of the officers or a representative of the organization hide your animal because they may take it from you, you might not know why, and you, may, you will never see that animal again. And that was how we were perceived by the community. And if, if everyone was um, here this morning when uh, the folks from Austin were talking, they obviously did an amazing job. You know, they, one of the things they had was the community embraced the, the life-saving uh, philosophies and they, they had that support. We did not. Um, but if you look at what, I, what, what we started with, a lot of it was pretty similar to what Austin had in, in 2005 when they started. So we knew that we had to go out into the community and actually make a difference in the streets, knocking on doors, which is what we, what we did. So the Pitbull, the Pitbull policy, um, WHS had actually been working with a city council member to institute a formal ban, a legal ban in the city. We were the key supporters of this legislation. So my, one of my first duties as the uh, person responsible for legislative affairs was to go to the city council member who has been a supporter of our organization. We were the, you know, the, he, we were their biggest, his biggest supporter for this bill that he believed in. Um, and, and, and I had to sit down with him and tell him not only were we no longer supporting his bill, but that we were going to publicly come out against it and publicly fight him. Um, it was not a good introduction to me um, to city council because uh, I knew nobody. Uh, and as you can tell, my accent is not, I'm not a local boy. I got that, you know, that thick Boston accent. Uh, didn't go over very well in D.C. city council. Um, but we knew what we had to do and we fought it. And he decided to try and proceed, uh, trying to proceed the, to, to get the law passed without our support. He had no idea that we were ready to launch a full campaign against it, and we did. And luckily, we had um, some really good supporters from other organizations. So we really didn't have a mailing list. We didn't have any way of sending out e-alerts uh, so to you know, get, gather people. But the, the flood of phone calls to city council made everyone panic and just pull the bill. And he tried again the next year. And it never made it out of committee, and that was the last time uh, he ever tried to implement, you know, tried to introduce that legislation. A few years later, he was completely voted out of office. Um, staff and volunteers, you know, they were really afraid of that. Now, imagine, imagine if you had a job that you were working at for years, and your entire career at this organization, you were told something. You were told. You didn't know any different, but you were told that these dogs, these dogs are dangerous. And if given the opportunity, they will hurt you. And then all of a sudden, 
two people come in from you know New England, and you know what do they know? Um, we come in and say everything you've learned is wrong, and we're not going to do it anymore. Wouldn't you have a little bit of like, uh, I don't know about this. I don't know about this. Who are these people? What's going on? Um, we had a behavior team. Um, we had a, a director of behavior and training, and I think at that point we had one person working under them. They had no idea how to do a pit bull evaluation. We were doing temperament tests for Rottweilers, for German Shepherds, for Cocker Spaniels. They were all the same, but my God, how do I do an evaluation on a pit bull? The, 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 the adoption staff didn't know how to do a pit bull adoption. Um, so we, we put together this group, uh, this working group, a committee, to, to implement the new policy. And I was on that policy, I was on that committee, and a little, little short sometimes on my patients, um, and I'm sitting in this committee and they're going all over the place and I just like, I'm stomping my foot saying, they're just dogs. They're just dogs, no different than the Rottweiler, the pit bull, I mean the, the, the German Shepherd or the Cocker Spaniel. Um, and we, you know, we eventually got them over it, the same with adoptions. And to give you an example of how far we came, uh, two years ago our adoption manager did a uh, presentation, I believe at the National uh, Animal Care Expo, and she did a, 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 a workshop on adoptions. And her quote was, I don't know why people are so weird or, or say pit bulls are so hard to adopt. We adopt them out every day. That's pretty much all we do. Um, so it went from that to that, which was, it, when I heard her say that, it was just like, oh, thank you, God. You know, it was just so, so wonderful. Um, and the other, the, the other problem um, that we faced was, the, the staff, the animal care staff was worried about now all of a sudden all of these new animals that never made it to the kennel were now going to be in the kennel and we're going to have twice as many animals as we used to because, you know, it, being in, I, I don't know if, if, if all of you are in, um, in major metropolitan areas, but in D.C., that's a huge percentage of dogs coming into our, uh, our shelter. Pipples make up a large percentage. So the staff was worried about these, all these animals coming in and we never had to deal with them before, but now we have to deal with them. So we, we worked with them on it. We got, you know, we got them to a better place and they understood that it's just a dog. And that's been our mantra. I, like, I love Stefan's uh, uh, thing, let's go be a dog. That's just, that says it all, it says it all. So um, we started uh, working to change the light, uh, the laws in the city. In 2010, we finally got a law passed that mandates the reduction of euthanasia. Couldn't get um, uh, um, anything more than the reduction in euthanasia, but it's a pretty, pretty good one. Um, we got a, the dangerous dog law is based on uh, behaviors of, of the dog and also behavior of the owners. Um, if you allow your dog to roam, at large for uh, you know three times within a year, um, you may get hit with a potentially dangerous dog ordinance, which increases the level of security that you need to place on, on, on the dog. It doesn't label the dog as much um, as, as being a dangerous dog. So uh, we also got a TNR provision, which we kind of snuck in there, uh, making TNR the preferred method of controlling community cats in the city. Uh, so we have always fall, fall, fallen back on that. And we also uh, updated the, the current law. When, when we first came down there in, in 2007, D.C. seemed to be stuck, uh, in my opinion, in the 70s and 80s with their laws and their policies and all that. Um, so we made um, dog fighting, uh, being present in a dog fight or an animal fight rather, a felony. Um, we introduced uh, mandated reporting. Uh, for uh, child, uh, child abuse and domestic violence advocates. If there are animals in the home, they have to report it to us. So things like that. The, the other thing was that there were really very limited, and I'll talk more about our wildlife procedures, but there, was very, there were no laws protecting wildlife. And one of our, one of our mantras um, is not only it's, it's just a dog, every, you know, every dog is, is just an individual, but every animal deserves the same level of protection. You know, just because it's a dog or a cat or a domestic cat or a feral cat or a raccoon or a possum, 
We feel we have the obligation to provide a level of protection for that animal. And we set out to make that happen. One of the, one of the things that um, I was working on in Massachusetts was um, uh, the, the, sta the, the trapping industry in Massachusetts kept trying to repeal a law that had been passed 10 years earlier banning uh, leg hole traps and corner bear traps and snare traps. And when I got to DC, I found out that you could set these traps in someone's yard. Um, you, could, you, could, you could hire someone to come out in your yard because if there was a, and this is, this is a, true, true, a true story, this is how I found out. Um, someone had called and said that every morning a fox ran through their yard and that they were afraid of that fox. And um, they hired a company to come out and set snare traps and leg hole traps in their yard. And it was legal. And I was disgusted by that. I mean, leg hole traps in my mind are, that's my biggest, it boils my blood. Um, so we had to get it, we had to make sure that that got passed. And also the, um, the people that you could hire to do this job um, had no regulations. There was nothing. Um, you could just, at the end of your day as a, as a whatever, you could throw a sign on your truck saying, Scott's Wildlife Trapping Company, and go out and do whatever you want, charge whatever you want, say whatever you want, kill the animal any way you want. Um, it was horrible. So we, 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 got, that, we got those laws passed um, to protect wildlife as well. I was making friends fast, as you can tell. Um, the, my, this, this is one of my favorites. So in 1929, the law regarding uh, community cats in the district was that the pound master um, would round up and kill all the cats roaming at large. So there was a, there was a, a law in D.C. before we got there to, to trap and remove feral cats. And show you how much it worked. I mean, you know, we can talk, we can talk about... Uh, uh, effective policies, but this is definitely not an effective policy. So uh, finally in 2010, I got a, a, one of the city council members who I think was just um, waiting for something like this to happen. She's amazing. Um, she helped us pass this law. And we could only get Shell promote um, the utilization of TNR as a means of controlling. Um, there was some opposition to it uh, within city council. So um, we did get promote, which is good because that gives us the basis for everything that we, we turn to. But um, when I talk about feral cats and, and, you know, when people talk about the effectiveness of TNR, this is a perfect example. 1929, they started rounding up and killing everything. In 2010, it was still a problem. Didn't, didn't work. Rounding up and killing didn't work. And we were the ones responsible for euthanizing those cats. We also felt we had to manage the flow of animals coming into the shelter. Again, we are, we are required to be a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week facility. Um, so at any point in time, at 3 o'clock in the morning, if you decide you don't want your animal anymore, um, you can bring them to the shelter and, and surrender them. Um, we have to have a staff member there 24-7. So uh, first thing I did was I got rid of the, um, the, what we referred to as the pick-up, give-up. And that is where the officers would just go out and uh, pick up an animal. So now if you called and said, I didn't want my animal anymore, rather than getting the standard answer of, okay, what's your address? Um, we trained our call takers to say, oh my gosh, what happened? What's the matter? How, how can we prevent that from happening? What can we do to help you keep the pet? And that really, it started a trend. Um, we started doing managed intake where people would call up, say, I need to surrender my pet, and we would have them set an appointment. If it was an emergency, we would never turn an animal away. If they showed up and said, no, I'm not going to come back tomorrow, we would still take that animal. But what we wanted to do was give them some time and give them a call and talk to them about any additional resources that we may be able to provide to help keep that animal in the home or rehome it themselves. You know, do you have any friends or neighbors? Is there any way we can, we can work with you to help you do the adoption? Can you foster the animal in your home and do an adoption from your home? Is that an option? We had to limit the number of animals coming into the shelter. Um, PMT stands for Population Management Team. And this, I, I just love, and I don't know if anyone else is doing this, but um, every single day, a team of staff members from the adoptions, from medical, behavior, 
uh, in animal care. Sometimes it's, you know, it could be foster, someone from foster, the foster program. In a group, they go and they look at every single animal in the building. And there's a couple hundred on any given day. And they look at each individual animal's situation and, and try and determine what that animal needs for a live outcome. Do we need, the, is this animal, this animal's been here for three or four days and he's still hiding, um, you know, hiding behind his uh, uh, corundabed. bed. He's still very scared. Is there a rescue we can turn to? Um, behavior, can you set a behavior modification program or, or, you know, let's get the volunteer program involved and get this, you know, make sure that this particular animal gets out more and gets more clicker training or what have you. And it's every single day. And at the end of the, the rounds, as we call them, an email goes out to, um, to all the leadership and all of the, the different departments. And as a breakdown, animal care, we need you to make sure that this, this, you know, it'll have the dog's name or the cat's name. This cat needs to have a, um, a catnip toy in the cage. This one needs a new scratcher. It's, it's no good anymore. Um, you know, make sure the medical notes are up to date. Uh, rescue, is there anyone might be interested in this dog? And it's just a whole list of, of things that everyone's required to look at from their individual department. Um, and whether I, I oversee the, um, the community cat program, sometimes they'll be on the PMT list. You know, this cat does not seem like he's thriving well in a shelter. Could this potentially be a candidate for TNR? And that way, my team would then have to go into the record, do you know, look it up? Was this a stray? Was it from an area that we know was uh, was feeding cats? So, if we determine yes or no, once we determine yes or no, we are then required to reply to that entire email string. No, this cat would not be a candidate. Animal care would have to come back saying, new toys and new scratcher has been placed. Uh, all, all items have been addressed uh, with the exception of this. So we know every single day, seven days a week, what's coming next. Um, we then started working on our outdated adoption policies. And I'll be honest with you, when I do this presentation, I've done this a couple of times, um, this raises a lot of eyebrows and this, this um, is a little controversial. Um, because we, we don't do home checks anymore. It's relatively easy to adopt an animal. Um, some rescue groups and some organizations have the luxury of having that time to, to go through uh, and, and do home checks and, and, and so forth. So I'm not saying anything negative about them. For us, they were outdated because they weren't working and animals were dying as a result of it. So we ceased doing those. Um, we do open adoptions where rather than, you know, I've, I've been doing this a long time. I did adoptions when I was young um, and we had a checklist. And if you, man, if you said something I didn't like to hear, man, I, you'd got a big X across your application. You got put onto a do not adopt list because they have a, they have a dog at home that isn't, you know, uh, isn't vaccinated. You're never going to get an, an animal from us. I never talk to them. Why isn't your dog vaccinated? You know, what's going on? I, I, I have a, one of my vets only believed in doing the distemper shots every few years until they were a certain age and then never again. They were indoor only cats. So I went by my vet's opinion and I wouldn't have been able to adopt an animal from me. You know, and, and so the, the overall, is everyone familiar with the term open adoptions? Does anyone do? Okay, yeah, good, good. Um, yeah, we started doing that and again it was, uh, you know, re retraining a lot of the staff uh, in, in how to talk to people rather than judging people. You know, and that was, that was a really big thing. And one of the things I, I, I should have mentioned in the very beginning when I started is I don't want anyone to think that um, I did all of this by myself and it was Lisa and I who, who you know, came in and, and flipped everything upside down. We put a team together. Uh, and that's really what it is. You know, when, when, when I said earlier about having someone come in and tell you, you the way you've been doing your job has been wrong, uh, blah, 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 we lost a lot of people. Turnover was astronomical back then. Um, my field services team, um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but just to give you an example, my, my, my field services team consists of five animal cruelty investigators, eight animal control officers, three animal control investigators, bite investigators, uh, a corporal, a sergeant, uh, 
and two directors overseeing the two different departments. It's a fairly large, um, fairly large department. When I came in to the time I have now, I have four people who were still there. The entire team except for four people turned over. Uh, on the management team, Lisa and I have the most seniority in the management team. Um, everyone, everyone left for one reason or another because they, um, anyone ever read Good to Great? Jim Collins, great book, um, talking about getting on the bus, the right people on the bus, getting the right people on and the wrong people off. And we spent a lot of time driving an empty bus. Um, <laughs> You know, we, we, were building, we were building our teams, and we were fortunate enough um, very early on to bring in um, a chief operating officer, Stephanie Shane. Uh, we stole her from Humane Society of the United States. And she oversees everything that happens inside the building, and I, have, I handle everything that happens outside the building. And um, so it, it has been a, a, a work of a team. And if that's the one thing you can take out of here, you need the right people with the right attitude, and you gotta get rid of the ones who don't. Because I can, we went in and we were forcing people to do things differently. They didn't believe in it, they might not want to have done it, but we were forcing them to work harder. And, and they just didn't want to. And then finally they were just like, I'm done with this. And they went over to, I'm not gonna mention a name, but there's a county next to DC that um, doesn't have the same reputation, and anyway, so. I'm not going to go there. But um, so I, I want to make that clear that everything I'm talking to you, it took us several years to do, and that was mainly because we had to get the right people in place to do it. And now we do have the right people in place, and we're skyrocketing. Um, the, um, the foster rescue program uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about. Um, we, we increased that. And our community-based programs, which I'm definitely going to talk more about in a minute, we had to actually do community-based programs. Um, we got this uh, wonderful RV uh, thanks to a grant, and we started bringing uh, animals into the community. People didn't want to come to our, our shelter. Uh, it's not the nicest place. Uh, we always laugh and joke and say we put a lot of lipstick on that pig, um, <laughs> but there's only so much you can do. It's still an old, rundown building. And uh, for, I'll give you, for instance, this is one of the easiest things we did. When, we, when you walked in the front door, there was a... Uh, a uh, counter right there, right smack dab in the middle. You couldn't get by that counter without facing down that front desk staff. Why are you here? What do you want? Um, so we took that away, and we put counters on either side. And then right in the middle, uh, against the wall, we put a bench, in case you want to sit down for a little while, in case it's busy. We painted the walls, that's the lipstick. Um, we made it nice, we made it inviting, and it, it, it did a lot. So we got this. Um, we also did, is that a pointer? No. Um, we came up with this slogan, DC loves DC animals, adopt DC. Um, so kind of playing off uh, uh, the pride of being a DC resident. Uh, DC is a very proud place. If you're a DC resident, you're very proud of that. Uh, so we, we wanted to play off that. Um, so we, were, we started bringing animals out into the community and showing them that these are not the broken animals that nobody wants. And adoption started skyrocketing. Um, I need to update this. The aggressive foster program with dedicated full-time staff, we have four full-time staff members. All they do is focus on adoptions. I mean, I'm sorry, foster, foster. Um, it, it's uh, such an, it, if you think about it, we, right now we probably have about 300 to 400 animals out in foster. That's a shelter, right? And, and to have an organization dedicate a part-time person or a volunteer to running a virtual shelter, um, it, it can be managed a lot better with full-time staff members. So we put, we put the, the resources that we felt we needed. We have a, a, a vet tech that only deals with foster animals. Um, we have two, we have foster caseworkers. Uh, I mean, we just built this program. It's, it's an amazing foster program uh, that has increased, well, you'll see the results in a few minutes. Um, we also made it part of the organizational promotion calendar because a lot of times, you know, these animals would go into foster care and the foster family would be responsible for promoting them. 
for getting them new homes. Well, we have just as much a responsibility. And, you know, we have all these, everyone who gets the pet of the week in the newspaper or on the, you know, the PSAs or, or even on the website. Um, you know, the foster animals were not part of that promotional calendar. So we started including them. And, you know, if you want to adopt this animal, this animal is currently in foster care, uh, you know, email, email the foster manager, blah, blah, blah. And, and getting exposure for those animals because you can put a foster animal out into a foster home and that animal stays there indefinitely. Um, but that's no different than a cage in your shelter. You know, that's a valuable space. If you have a foster care uh, family, that's a valuable space that you can utilize to save an animal's life. So you need to do, you need to treat it just like you would your shelter. Get them in, get them out. Get them in, get them out. Uh, and that's, that's, what we, that's what we do. With the off-site adoptions, um, the fosters are invited to come down and highlight their animals, showcase their animals. And um, yeah, that's the increased resources offered. Uh, they can come into the shelter. They can bring them in on a Saturday morning and stay with their animals and talk to members of the public about those animals as individuals. Um, decreasing euthanasia for certain medical conditions. I mean, you know, we, again, we were a high-volume shelter, so... Um, you know, pan leukopenia. Um, how many of you have ever had a pan leuk outbreak in your shelter? Or, um, it's not fun. And a lot of animals historically will die as a result of that. And, and, and I, bring up, I bring pan leuk up specifically because I'm really, I'm really proud of what's happening today. As I'm standing here on this stage, we are dealing with a pan leuk. We are dealing with a three, third time in a row um, consecutive pan leuk outbreak at our shelter, and nobody has been euthanized because of it. And we had shelter, we had we had we had cats come down with pan leuk. They tested positive. They got sick. We 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 saved them. Then we thought we had it cleared. It broke again. We thought we had it cleared. It broke again. Right now we are under uh, strict quarantine at our shelter, but the nobody's dying because of it. And when I worked in the shelter, man, as soon as someone got sick. Everybody died. Everybody died. And then we just cleaned everything, let, let it sit and bleach for 24 hours, and then started back up. Um, and that's the way it used to be. That's the way it used to be. I started in shelters in 1988. Um, so, you know, back then we didn't, we didn't have the same philosophies, the same, you know, that was the norm. Um, so those, are, those days are gone. Those days are all gone now. Okay, um, so we had to, again, we, we couldn't do anything with the community hating us and being afraid of us. So we really had to change our reputation in the community. And I, I, I mentioned about DC Loves DC Animals and, and, and so forth. I already mentioned that. Um, but we wanted to get a little creative. Um, and, and, you know, I remember I, I, was, I was overseeing the marketing department when the Sharknado movie came out. And we had our marketing meeting on a Monday morning, and um, my, my director was saying, yeah, I, you know, this whole Sharknado thing, blah, blah, blah. And then one thing led to another, and all of a sudden it was like, oh, Catnado, let's do it. And within an hour of that conversation, this flyer was made, and we did a fee-waived adoption for, the, um, for, for, um, for all cats on this specific date. Now... That's another thing I want to bring up is fee-waived adoptions. How many of you do fee-waived adoptions? Good, good. A lot of people, like that's another thing when I talk about fee-waived adoptions, people are like, oh, you're just giving them away to anybody and abusers are going to come in and take them and, you know, and all that. It doesn't happen. We don't do anything different than we would if we were taking a check. That's the only difference. At the end of the adoption process, we don't take the check. We encourage them. We encourage them to go into our little retail store and buy some toys and stuff like that. But a lot of people leave donations anyway. Um, fee waived adoptions studies show have no higher rate of return than a, a, a an adoption that costs one hundred and fifty two hundred dollars. That's a fact. And you know there are times um, they were talking this morning in 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 uh, the Austin when, when he had the graph and he said kitten season came and they plummeted again. Um, that's a prime time for doing fee waived adoptions. You know because there there are people out there that want to come in and they're like well you know I don't know but getting that out there. You think the media picked up on this here? Well, the media was all over this. That landed on BuzzFeed. I'm not a tech. I'm sorry. Is that right? BuzzFeed. That's the real thing. Yeah, that landed on BuzzFeed, right? 
That's why I no longer handle the marketing department. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, this also won an award. Um, uh, HSUS uh, at their expo did a, uh, a national you know, uh, contest for adoption campaigns. Uh, Catnado won it. We did a Catnado 2. Uh, you know, and then this one, you know, again, getting back to that pride of D.C., the cherry blossoms. If you've never seen the D.C. cherry blossoms, they're gorgeous. And I'm not a big, like, you know, uh, plant guy, but anyway, they are really attractive. So we were like, how can we, you know, cherry blossoms are coming, they're blooming, uh, let's do a spay-neuter thing. And we put that together. Um, so these are the types of things that, you know, as, as a member of the community, you started seeing from us. You know, you started seeing these creative, fun, uh, you know, not, um, not a dog behind a cage looking all sad, um, which is what we, we, we changed our entire PR strategy. Uh, now this, you know, this works for us. I'm not saying, you know, because I know a lot of people still use the, the negative images and all that. Um, what works for us, um, we, you will never see an animal behind a cage or a sad looking animal in any of our promotional stuff. We want people to look at these animals as though they were looking at them as being in their backyard or on their couch. Um, we want you to see what it's capable of. This isn't a broken animal with behavior problems that's stuffed into a cage. This is an animal that's gonna have a great time and cuddle up with you on your couch and run and play ball and fetch sticks and you know chase your kids around. Um, we also don't do desperate pleas. We don't say, you know, uh, this dog has been with us for, you know, six months. If no one adopts him, he's going to be euthanized. So please come adopt. We don't do that. The only time we use desperate pleas are when um, we're in need of foster homes. And we will go out. We have a, uh, I should probably include that next time. But we have a couple of different ads. Um, like, um, keep your, one of my favorites is keep your mother-in-law or your in-laws away from your house rent out your spare room um, to a foster animal. Yeah, and then like a picture of a dog. Hey, can I stay on your couch for a couple of days? Things like that. Um, you know, but again, the, you know, we, we, we always wanna share the adoption stories to show people, especially those animals that might be hard to adopt uh, or might not necessarily seem like the ones that are uh, likely to be adopted. You know, uh, someone mentioned earlier about ugly animals and all that. We all know there are no ugly animals, but there are some ugly animals out there, you gotta admit. Um, and we, you know, we, we love when they get adopted because those are the cutest, you know? And you put a picture up on the web of, you know, a dog with his jaw, you know, his jaws all, you know, he's got that overbite and he's blind in one eye. And, you know, I love those old, those little old dogs. You all know what I'm talking about. You've all been there. Um, I love those dogs and I love promoting those dogs. You know, um, and, and being that we do a lot of uh, animal cruelty stuff, we have the opportunity to um, show those negative images, but we don't. We always do the before and after, uh, you know, when we're going public. The only, the only uh, uh, disclaimer on that is we do wanted posters, sometimes wanted for information, reward posters, and sometimes those get graphic uh, because we want the community to see what someone in your neighborhood has done um, because we, when we have a case that we can't solve, we will put flyers together, offer a reward for information, and then plaster the neighborhood. Okay, so working in the community. Um, we, uh, this was my baby here, working in the community. Um, this is our, our shield. Now this center logo got taken out. We put the new logo down on the bottom. Um, we put that in there, but we wanted to project not only a sense of professionalism uh, and, and seriousness to the community, but also a friendliness. So we changed our uniforms. We don't look like the local police department anymore. Um, we uh, go out and we uh, focus more on um, being a member of the community. So let's start with uh, community cats. Loosen the restrictions on feral management. It used to be where you would have to have um, a, well, first of all, we do free, free TNR surgeries for any district cat. Uh, any, anyone who's trapping in the city, we do it for free. But 
you had to agree to be the lifelong caregiver. You had to um, have a file with the animal's records in there. You had to be able to show that if you were going away for the weekend that you had someone who could provide food to that animal. It was almost as bad as our adoption policies were back then. And the world just doesn't work like that. The world just doesn't work like that. It, it, perfect example was we, um, we were doing TNR and we, we, we got a call about a cat in an alley. We showed up and um, this cat clearly lived in the neighborhood. He was not a lost pet. He was not an abandoned pet. He was a Tom and he was just all badass and he's looking around like, this is my alley and if you want to commit it, you got to get through me. So we looked and we saw, we saw a yard with some food bowls and, and, and so forth. My officer picks up the cat. Um, Put you know gets him in a carrier. At that point, the guy came out and he's all nervous. He sees the the big scary animal control truck, and uh, he's like, "Oh, what are you doing? What are you doing with Freddy? What are you doing with Freddy the cat?" And my officer says, "Don't worry about it. We're gonna we're gonna sterilize him. You'll notice that he'll have a notch in his ear. He's gonna get air tipped. We're gonna give him all the shots. He's gonna be fine. We'll bring him back tomorrow. It's gonna be fine. Here's some cat food. Have this ready and waiting. Hope this alleviates some of your financial burden. Great." Pete leaves. Next day, Pete comes back with Freddie. As he pulls into the alley to release Freddie in front of his yard, a woman comes out of a house over here calling the cat Fluffy, whatever the cat. She's like, oh my God, I saw you take him yesterday. I thought he'd never come back. Blah, blah. It's like, do you know that this guy's calling him Freddie and feeding him? Well, no. So, you know, he went over, got Mr. Smith or whatever his name was, introduced the two neighbors, um, and they started agreeing to work with the cat. Now the cat's bumming out because he used to get a breakfast, a breakfast, a dinner, a dinner, and now he gets a breakfast and a dinner. Um, so I'm sure he hates us for that. But you know, those, that's, that's community cats. Those are community cats. You know, the community is embracing that. And, and you know, talking to the rest of the community about going out and, and helping, you know, helping these people care for the cats also enables us to find out if there are any, um, any conflicts that need to be re resolved. You know, there are people who don't want the cats in their yards for whatever reason. And we literally go door to door to door in these neighborhoods. When we release Freddie, we will not only talk to these people, but we will go door to door. And if you're not home, we'll put a door hanger on your door saying that we've trapped cats in your neighborhood. And please call us if you have any questions or concerns. And um, we, in, we get the community to embrace the, 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 the program and work together. Saves resources. You know, now if there's a, if there's a problem, uh, if they notice the cat is injured or sickly, they're not afraid to call us. They're not afraid that if, you know, well, he's limping, so I shouldn't call animal control because animal control will come and kill him. They know that's not going to happen. They know if that cat is limping or, or sickly, that we're gonna come pick them up and get them to a vet. And you know, hopefully we'll be able to help that animal out. Um, we do a lot of dentals. Uh, you'd be amazed, we'll, we'll get people who call us and say, my community cat is acting sickly, he's really thin. Um, I, think, you know, I think it might be his time. Um, and we'll go out, we'll get the cat, or we'll, they'll bring the cat in, and he's just got a really bad dental problem. We'll just yank the teeth and put him back out. And he's under the watchful eye of the community. Um, so that's, you know, that's the good part. Then there are those people that are, you know, like, well, if those cats come in my yard anymore, I'm going to kill them. And he's urinating in my flower bed and using my, litter, uh, my uh, sandbox as a litter box. And historically, people involved in TNR would be confrontational and adversarial with those people. And you shouldn't be. I mean, these people want to protect their property. They don't, they don't have the same values and, and, and view on cats that we might. So we work with them. We'll go out and we'll, we'll, we'll sit down with them and we'll talk to them about different ways of preventing the problems from occurring. And I have this um, picture down here um, of a cat stop. Uh, I don't even know if they're making those. They, I think they changed the name to something else, but it's an ultrasonic um, motion activated ultrasonic sensor that when the cat walks into the yard, it scares the heck out of him and he takes off. Um, that and the scarecrow, the motion activated sprinkler systems are my favorite 
my absolute favorite thing in the world because it helps not only with unwanted cats, it helps with unwanted wildlife, um, you know, dogs, any animal that might be coming into your yard, it'll scare them away. Uh, and, and neighborhood kids, works great for the neighborhood kids. <laughs> Although my, the kids in my neighborhood know it now and they love it in the summer, they'll run across my yard just to get sprayed. They think it's the coolest thing. But, you know, it, it, it works and it shows the community, the haters too, that, okay, we, we care. We, we care about your views. We care about your opinions. And, you know, if you want them to stop spraying on your house, why don't you contribute to the fund and we'll neuter them and he'll be less apt to spray. You know, that's a stretch, but it's worked. It's worked. Anyone familiar with the Pets for Life program uh, out of HSUS? It's an amazing, amazing program. Um, it's, it's basically designed to go into the most at-risk areas in, the, in your city and provide free resources to, to the, the pet owners. Um, now, the, they, if you go on to HSUS's website, you can download the toolkit, which is like the Bible. It gives you step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step instructions on how to conduct this program. So basically what we did was we did a community assessment on which neighborhood needs the most work. And um, if you're not familiar with DC, uh, Southeast DC, Anacostia is very low income. There is one vet clinic in the area that um, keeps very odd hours. I mean, she's just a member of the community that wants to give back as much as she can, but she can't do it uh, all the time. There are no pet supply stores. There are no groomers. There are no, um, there's no pet resources in, in, in this neighborhood. And we refer to it as east of the river um, because it's, it, if you know DC, it's almost like a broken, not DC's broken, um, <laughs> triangle. Um, and at the bottom section of it, it's cut off by the Anacostia River. And on the other side of the river from the main mainland of DC is um, what's referred to east of the river. And that's a very low income uh, area. Um, most of the people don't even have transportation. You know, a lot of people think that people who live like that or even homeless, I'm going to go off on a little bit of a rant here, um, if you don't have enough money, you shouldn't have pets. And I don't believe that. Um, I believe that these people love their animals as much as we do. And some, some of these people rely more on their animals than we do, you know? So, um, so what we do is, and, and a lot of these people don't have transportation, so they can't, they can't go to a clinic. They can't bring their animal to a clinic. We have a low-cost um, spay-neuter clinic that provides low-cost vaccinations, uh, and it's on this side of the river, but it's right on the, right on the border. And our very first Pets for Life client was a woman in, in her, I want to say 60s. Um, she had a two-year-old pity type. Um, wrong dog for her, probably, because he was full of energy, and she, you know, obviously couldn't, probably couldn't give him the exercise he needed. But, um, God, she loved that dog. She loved him. She walked three miles to get him his shots and then back because it's the right thing to do. He needs his shots. So you think for a second that I didn't yank that dog, bring him over to the clinic, get him neutered, get him that, and bring him back with bags of dog food and toys. We gave him a Kong. He had never played with a Kong before. Okay, he had never seen a Kong before. If you are living paycheck to paycheck, well, let me ask you this. How many of you have dogs that you've given a Kong toy to? Okay. How many of you have cats that you've, you've played with a wand toy? Okay. A Kong is equal to about four days worth of food in a 7-Eleven, where most of these people are buying a lot of their dog food from, okay? Four days of food or a Kong toy for people, someone who's living paycheck to paycheck, okay? I, that's why my, the people who do Pets for Life with me, they must, I must drive them crazy because you do not go to a home without a toy. I don't care if, it, if it's a, we have, she kept my, my, my uh, program manager, Cavi, a big bag of catnip with uh, cat toys marinating in it. And uh, you do not go to a house and not give a toy. So, um, yeah, so we go, we go and we, we literally block the block. And that means we'll pick a, we'll pick a neighborhood and we'll start on, at the first house, knock on the door. Hi, we're with the Humane Rescue Alliance Pets for Life program. We're looking for pet owners that we can give free services to. 
free? Or, or, what do you got? Well, I don't have any pets, but my neighbor down the street does. And we just go door, literally door to door. When I say door to door, I mean door to door. Like the Jehovah Witnesses get annoyed with us um, because we do better than they do, all right? Sorry, I didn't mean if anyone's, didn't mean anything <laughs> derogatory by that. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Um, so yeah, but we give out free flea treatment, free, free frontline or Vantage during the summers. Um, we give free vaccines, free sterilization, transportation. Um, we'll pick the animal up, bring them to the clinic, get them all taken care of, and bring them back. Um, it's an amazing program that has probably saved the lives of, of so many animals um, and prevented more animals from coming in because this was an area that we saw a large amount of animals coming in uh, from, uh, puppies, kittens, so forth. And if I may, I just want to go back to the, I mentioned homeless animals. Um, you know, when, when I first came to D.C., if you were a homeless person living on the streets with an animal, it got taken away from you. You had no right to having an animal because you couldn't, you couldn't possibly care for this animal as much as, as much as I believe you should. All right, so those of you with a dog, let me ask you a question. If you could ask your dog this one question, what do you think your dog's answer would be? I would rather spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week, by your side, never leave your side, but it means I have to sleep curled up with you in a tent or a box or someplace under a bridge. Or I would rather stay home while you're at work, sitting on my couch, waiting for you to come home exhausted, take me for a short walk or a run, maybe play with my toys while you're cooking dinner, get a little bit of food, and then we go to bed. You go to bed. What do you think your dog's going to answer? I know my dogs. You know, my dogs are going to want to stick by my side 24-7. They don't care if they sleep in a twin-size bed, a king-size bed, or what their sleep number is. <laughs> they don't care about that. All they care about is by my side. And if I'm living in the streets and I have my dog, that's going to make me feel a lot better. So why should we take these animals from them? Why not? So now my officers, they'll show up and they'll, they'll say, you need food. Oh, and my boss is making me give you a toy. Um, <laughs> food, medical, the, you know, the Pets for Life program extends you know, for, for, for some medical stuff. We help them. Imagine that. We help a pet owner. Anyway, that's my rant. All right. Animal control, the big bad animal control officers who come and take my animal and I never see them again. We moved away from enforcement. I mean, as it was put very eloquently this morning in the, in the Austin talk, animal control, their primary function is supposed to be public safety. They're a public service, but I believe, and now my entire team believes, that there is this balance that you can, you can get between public safety and animal safety. There is that balance. You can protect the, the public and the animals as well. And we don't have to be, we don't have to be stormtroopers about it. You know, give people a chance. Give them a break. Find out what's going on, what's happening. Evaluate what is, what is needed versus what's being done. You know, is, is what we're doing, is, is us going out and issuing warning notices and citations and all that, is that really what we need to do? Or do we need to talk to people about the importance of, of complying with the laws and how if you license your dog, money goes into the program so that we can save more lives? And, you know, if the, heaven forbid the dog ever gets lost, a contractor leaves the gate open, this is how we're going to be able to get your dog back to you. Um, so it's, it's a softer, more um, community-based approach to animal control. And they're all part of um, the TNR program, too. So, you know, the officers are out doing TNR. The officers are out doing Pets for Life. Um, when, when my officers go to dog parks, um, they used to, you know, people would grab their dogs and, you know, do all this. Now... They're, they go to the dog parks with a big old bag of biscuits and they, they don't even check licenses. They don't even check licenses. They hand out the dog bones, toss the ball around, start talking to the people, hang out there for five or ten minutes when they have time. Just be there. Be there. Answer questions. And I had one officer who was not very, not very happy with that. 
And I knew he was a good man. I'm trying to bring him along, trying to bring him along. He's like, yeah, I'll do it. He's, he's going. He's talking to the people. And then he comes to me one day, and he says, Scott, he says, I got a tip on an animal hoarder from someone at the, at the dog park. He's like, this is, this is amazing. If you be nice to people, they'll give you information. <laughs> and it was like, I really, like, HR frowns on me when I do this, but I wanted to just like slap him on the forehead, you know? It's like, <laughs> duh. Um, so yeah, so um, he has now come around and he actually goes out and does um, uh, neighborhood meetings. Um, he'll go in and talk to, um, you know, talk about dog bite prevention. He loves going into schools. His name is Ed, um, and he's a handful, but now he calls himself Humane Ed. Uh, and that's what he does when he goes into the schools. Uh, he's a good man. He's just a kid. You know, and here's someone, Ed grew up in the city, and he lost a brother to gang violence. Um, he grew up in one of the roughest parts of D.C. He should, by all, all for... Uh, you know, all statistics, he should have become a statistic. And he's now one of my top investigators. Um, and he's just so proud of that. So, you know, we're, we're taking people from the communities that they're serving, because those are the people who know the community better. And he's going out talking to communities, um, you know, community meetings, doing community relations. We used to, animal control, if you called and said every morning a raccoon, every time I bring my trash out and put it in the trash bin outside, a raccoon comes over and knocks the trash barrel over and rips open my trash. Do you believe this? We would go out and set a trap, take that animal and kill him. And when I found that out, I was like, are you crazy? Well, we have to, we have to respond to the public's complaint. And that's always been a, a real sticking point with animal control because they feel they have this mandated duty to respond to every single complaint, you know? And they get more complaints. We get more complaints than we do accolades. I mean, nobody calls up, well, I don't want to say nobody, but we get more people calling up saying, hey, I have a problem than we do, hey, I love you guys. Um, so, you know, I, I put an end to that and, I, and, and now we do conflict resolution. So if someone calls up and says that raccoon's knocking over my trash can, the dispatcher, um, says, oh, wow, that must be annoying. Um, let's work together on how to solve that. What kind of trash can you, what kind of cover do you have on your trash bin? You know, uh, and just talking to them about conflict resolution and solving the problem without even having to send an officer out. How am I doing on time? Okay, okay. Um, so, and then again, the, the humane law enforcement, animal cruelty investigations, um, you know, we went back to community policing versus enforcement. Um, we solve more cases now in the living room than we do in the courtroom. Um, because most of the cases we're dealing with are not those malicious, callous acts of violence. Those guys still get arrested and go right, you know, do not pass go, go right to jail. Um, but the majority of people, you know, they don't know any different. Or they're trying, or, or they're just, they're, they're, they're just, um, they just don't know. So rather than going and taking these animals away from them and, and overburdening the shelter and causing unnecessary death, we're working with them. We're continuing the, to, to, we're trying to uh, uh, improve the quality of life that they have. And if that means, you know, making sure that they have an adequate dog house. Um, because, you know, someone doesn't want their dog just in the house 24-7 when they're home. They want the dog outside. There's no law that says you can't leave your dog outside. There's no law that says that. There's a law that says if you do, you have to provide shelter to that animal. Um, and there are a lot of people who believe um, that they, the, the dog should, you know, should be in the house, that they should be outside. So it's a moral, it's a, it's a question that you have to ask yourself as a cruelty investigator, do I take that animal away from this? Otherwise, uh, you're shaking your head, you know. So, um, you know, do I take this animal away because he's not allowed in the house. Even though the kids go out and they play with him, he gets adequate food, water, veterinarian care. Um, or do I work to improve that quality of life? Do I do clicker training with them? Do I teach them how to do training? Do I have one of the trainers call them or come out and do a site visit and get them to a point where they may want to bring the animal in the house? You know, maybe they're not bringing the animal in the house because they don't know how to housebreak an animal or that the dog uh, is chewing things up. Um, it's things like that that you know, we never looked at before. We never thought about before, but you have to. If you want to save lives, 
These are the types of things you have to do. And plus, when you bring the animal into the shelter, it's not fair on the animal. I mean, he, again, you know, would they rather be out in that backyard with their family or would they rather be thrown into a shelter where it's chaotic and, and you know, um, it's scary? I mean, everyone, I don't care how nice of a shelter you have, the animal will never understand why their world has just been flipped upside down and brought into a shelter. Um, so when I, when I talk about evaluating trends and strategized solutions, does anyone use mapping programs? No? A couple people love mapping programs. G ARC, GIS, is a software program. You can, uh, I don't know how much it costs, but there's a cost to it. Um, we feed our data into um, that program and it gives you maps of what's happening in different parts of the city. So we will, we will take, um, on a monthly basis, we'll, you know, we'll dump uh, more data in and we'll watch how in one part of town we may be getting uh, more abandonments. And this is actually exactly what happened east of the river. Um, I think after this, uh, I'm gonna be talking uh, on a panel about pets and housing. And um, DC Housing Authority is violating federal law and does not allow pets in, in their property. But people get pets. And when, when they get moved or when they shut down a housing unit, those people are afraid of what's gonna happen to their pets. They can't get caught because they might not get their voucher for housing. They're afraid that they're, if they bring it to the animal shelter that we're just a government agency and we have to report it. So they let their animal out, especially cats. When you see a group of community cats out there, they're living fine, people are caring for them. Blah, blah, blah. Why should I bring my cat to the shelter? I can just open the door and put them out with those cats. So we actually noticed an uptick in one area um, of abandoned cats. And then we found out that there was a large housing development in that area that was being uh, leveled. Um, they were gonna be renovating the whole thing. And we, all of a sudden we said, wow, look at all these new abandoned cats in the neighborhood. So we started strategizing. Then we went and found out where the next housing development was, going, was slated to be renovated. And we started strategizing an anti-abandonment campaign for there. And we'll go out and we'll knock on doors. We'll give management the flyers, bring them to us, call us. So it's strategizing after evaluating the trends that are happening. And it just, it, it makes it more efficient for the officers so they don't have to just be running around uh, addressing complaints uh, uh, in, in a reactive nature. It's being more proactive. And again, the whole thing with me, like in my obsession with making sure everyone has toys, I also have this obsession that every officer has to do community meetings. Um, the ANC meetings, which is the Area Neighborhood Council, um, the crime, crime Watch meetings, civic group meetings. Um, there's so many community meetings out there. Uh, we have to be there. We have to be there. And if we're not presenting, we at least have to be sitting in the audience in uniform, talking to people, handing out cards, talking to people, just being there. That's a, that's a given. And it gives the officers overtime, which they seem to enjoy. <laughs> so some of the obstacles that we, we faced with all of this um, is that it is harder, it is harder to save lives um, than it is to kill them. Um, but we're here for that reason. And um, you know, each animal is an individual and deserves available resources. Again, with the PMT, what do we have? What can we do for this animal today? But I wanted to touch really on this, just can't throw the switch, that didn't work. With us, we did one day decide, okay, we're not gonna euthanize anymore. And we became no kill. We just turned it on, didn't work. Staff wasn't prepared for it. Staff didn't know how to handle the, 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 the new, um, uh, uh, the new influx, or not influx, but the new handling of the animals, the housing of the animals, there were more animals. And some of the staff, they, they, weren't, they, they didn't want that. That's not why they were there. They didn't want to work harder. So we had to start getting rid of them. So yeah, we did have to throw the switch, realize it wasn't working, and then back up a little bit and say, okay, what do we need to do? How do we get our staff ready so that we can, we can save more lives? What programs do we have to have in place? And we have to share a common goal. The entire organization has to share the common goal of save as many lives as we can today. What can we do today, right now, with the resources we have to save every animal we have in front of us? And that's how we, 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 we work. Um, we never accept status quo. And I think that's the one thing that really pushed a lot of people off the bus. 
um, because we never rest on our laurels. It is, it is difficult to work for the Humane Res Rescue Alliance. I'm not used to the name yet. That's why I keep saying it. Um, it's, it can be difficult to work for us because we're never satisfied. Uh, I'll show you the results in a second of where we are. Um, but the, as long as there are animals out there that need us, we have work to do. And we need to get to that point. So it's kind of, um, it can get frustrating at times. It's like we just had this big event. Yay, we, we adopted out 100, 117 animals today. Yay, let's, let's celebrate. Okay, let's celebrate tonight. But tomorrow, cages are going to be full again. So we've got to get back to work. We've got to figure out something else to do tomorrow. And, and making, the, um, making the staff part of the solution. You know, they, they, they have opinions, whether it's an animal caregiver or our facilities guy. Just, just Friday, Thursday, yeah, Thursday, um, we, we have this whole Panloo quarantine. And one of the shelters that we shut down um, because of the merger, we had this little boutique shelter, and we had some old shoreline cages in the basement uh, that we, we needed them and because of this quarantine. So the, the shelter staff called and said, hey, I need a dozen more cages. What can we do? I said, well, we got these cages in the basement of, 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 of the old shelter, shoreline cages. Let's rip those apart and get them over to the shelter. So I go to the, the facilities guy, the maintenance guy, and I say, Kenny, I said, we got to run over to the old shelter down on the other side of town, rip those cages apart, get them over to the other shelter, and put them back together. And he looks at me and he says, oh, are you kidding me? I, I can't do that today. I, I, got, I got leaky toilets, I got this, I got this going on. I can't, I can't do that today. I said, I looked at him, I said, Kenny, if we don't do this, cats will die. You know what his response was? Let's go. So here's the maintenance guy. That's what I'm referring to as sharing a common goal. Everyone in the organization has to be on the same page, the same level of saving lives today. The, this point I'm going to talk about, I'm going to air some dirty laundry, but we did it publicly. Um, but this really gave us owning mistakes, even if they're public, and then learn from them. This gave us a really great opportunity to show transparency in the community and to show them that there are new people in town and we're not going to, we're not going to mess around. Um, several years ago, we had a, a situation with a, dog, a stray dog that came in. Um, an owner who came in couldn't prove that it was her dog, um, went back, boyfriend came in, yelling and screaming, fighting, um, got into a confrontation with the front desk staff. Nothing was properly done. Nothing was properly recorded. And that dog was euthanized. And we had a family who owned this animal. And we could have just said, I understand. Here you go. So most... I don't, I don't want to say most, some animal shelters, humane societies would have gotten up in front of a camera and said, well, they might not have even gotten in front of a camera. Um, they would have said something like, well, you know, we have policies in place to protect animals, and that's what our ultimate goal was. And unfortunately, this family did, didn't keep proper records, didn't have veterinarian records, and couldn't prove that they were the owner, and it's a tragic situation. That's not what we did. We fired everyone involved, stood up in front of a camera, looked into the, the camera and said, we screwed up. This is horrible. What we did was horrible. And we will never let it happen again. And we're taking every step possible, including the termination of anyone involved in it. But we are learning from this. And this is what we're going to do. We are getting new. We are, we are signing off. Now every single euthanasia that occurs has to happen uh, with the signature of a director. Every single record has to be checked before a euthanasia occurs. Every single I is dotted, uh, T, you know, I is dotted and T is crossed before an animal is euthanized. Sounds horrible. It was horrible, I know. But I think if your local shelter got up and said that in front of a camera, would you believe them? Would you give them just a little bit more credibility for not trying to hide from it, not trying to cover up their horrible, horrible mistake? Um, and it was the last time it ever happened. It was the last time it happened. Hey, mistakes happen. You know, people make mistakes, but this, you know, this could have been avoided and went, it's not going to happen again. 
costs. You know, that costs are always a consideration. Um, uh, medical costs increased. You know, uh, I've heard a lot of people say that, you know, uh, increasing your live release rate uh, shouldn't cost much of anything, you know, and, and um, it does. You know, medical costs, when you're, when you're looking at saving animals' lives because of um, no longer euthanizing for parvo, heartworm, all of these things, mange, ringworm, my God, ringworm's so hard to treat, and, you know, um, it, the costs increase. But when you don't have an increase in your budget, you shift things. You find ways of shifting things. Um, you know, certain programs like the, 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 um, the, the My Pets for Life program, the woman who runs that program used to be the humane educator. She used to go into schools and um, teach children how to be kind to animals. We did away with that program. I, get, I love humane ed. I've been doing humane education most of my career. But when you're looking at two programs, a program that's going to go door to door offering free services to people who have no access to service, or go into a school and teach children how to be kind to animals, what are you going to pick? It, it's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. So we, we canceled one program, moved her and her volunteer staff into this, retrained them, and got them into, um, you know, more into the, 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 the Pets for Life model. Overtime, yeah. I mean, we had to pay overtime. Um, my, like I said, the officers have to go do outreach. They have to. And that means I have to pay them. I have to. You know, uh, we, don't have the, we don't always have the time to do it during their shift, and it wouldn't be fair because those only happen at nights. You know, the, the community meetings are generally only at night or on Saturday mornings. So those officers in those shifts would be the only ones able to do it. So now, you know, if my overnight officer, I have an officer that shows up at 11 o'clock and he works until 8 in the morning. If he wants to come in a couple hours early, do a community outreach meeting, I'll pay him for it. I'll give him the money for that. And he loves doing it. Um, but, you know, the, and, and again, the basic supplies, when you're not killing animals, you do have to feed them and clean up after them and all that, so there's a little bit of increase in that. But it all works out with the ad adoptions, because you have to balance it, you know, and that's one of the things that we, when, when I said we threw the, sh sh uh, the switch, we didn't have the adoption, the foster, the rescue, we didn't have, that wasn't in a place where it would balance out the housing of the animals, and that's one of the problems it caused. So once we got to that balance, that equilibrium, where we could, and now we're just constantly moving that, moving that bar up. So let's take a look at what happened. So there's our live release rate. Um, you can see we started, again, 2007. We came in in uh, November of 2007. Um, which is, you know, we missed half the year of, of being able to do it. So that's why 2008 was really our, our running point. Um, and it just has steadily increased. We, we never, you know, maybe in a month it'll dip, dip down. Uh, right now, uh, year to date, I think we're at 89. Um, but we're confident by the end of the year that we'll, we'll be able to break 90 again. Um, so this is where we're at, and this is what we do. Um, but it's, it's, it's a team. It's... Everyone has to be, you know, on the same page, doing the, with the same mission, the same goals, and, and busting their butts every day, all day. Any questions?